Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Gemology for Schmucks. My name is Peter Nelson, and I'm here to guide you in everything you need to know about gemstones and jewelry. Today, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the weeds. We're going to be talking about something that I've been alluding to for a little while that is going to help you if you are in a particularly tight spot on gem identification. So we've got our refractometer here and our polariscope. These are the normal tools, but there's some additional information that they can provide to you if you know what you're looking for. And then we're going to be talking about something called optic character and optic sign. The optic figure we've spoken about before with the polariscope. So I'll talk briefly about that. But what I really want to focus on is the optic sign. And yeah, that's a lot of terms, blah, blah, blah. Don't let it get you down because we're going to go through the visuals, help you understand what it means and why it can help you if you're doing especially tricky gem identification. So as a quick recap, the polariscope uses two polarized filters. So when they're in crossed filters, it helps us to know whether or not it's a crystalline material, whether or not it splits light or doesn't. Stones that do split light can be separated into two other categories. Stones that do not split light are either singly refractive crystals or they're amorphous. Amorphous would be something like glass or opal. Something that's singly refractive, so that means it is a crystal, would be like diamond or spinel. So inside of the polariscope, it's not going to blink. Once it starts blinking, we open up this whole other world. So in crystallography, which is a subsection of chemistry about how crystals grow and form and deal with light and all these other properties, there are seven crystal systems in the mineral world. Singly refractive are only a part of that isotropic group, otherwise known as the cubic crystal system. Uniaxial has three crystal systems. So in the polariscope, it's going to blink. And when we use the coniscope, we get that cross. The uniaxial cross is a very clear sign that it is uniaxial and it cannot lie to us. Once you see that optic figure using the coniscope, we are certain that it's uniaxial. There's some unique cases like with quartz, but if you want to learn all about the polariscope, you should go and check out that video where we dive into it. And keep in mind that I've got a kit to help you along. If you haven't seen these optic figures before, the kit is the easiest way to get used to those symbols. That optic figure is easiest to see inside of cabochons. But if we don't have that, we can also find out that it's uniaxial using the refractometer. But that's where it gets a little bit more tricky because you have to pay very close attention to the numbers that are coming through this device. So uniaxial and biaxial. In the polariscope, we get a symbol, which is nice and easy, either the uniaxial cross or the biaxial bow tie. I love when I can find that because this does not lie. But if I need to confirm or if I can't find it, then I can come over to the refractometer. So the refractometer is going to give me either one number or a set of numbers. And if you need a tutorial on how to use the refractometer, please go and watch that video. In this one, we can't get that far into it because it'll take forever. But part of the reason that we need to be very careful as we rotate the stone around, checking with very small changes, going all the way through 180 degrees, is because the maximum and minimum birefringence ranges are very important for us. That's how we know, is it uniaxial or is it biaxial? And then, whether it's uniaxial or biaxial, it can still have a positive or negative optic sign. You can kind of think of it like a charge. No, you can't. So first off, what is uniaxial? In uniaxial, basically your birefringence, the maximum and minimum birefringence, what's going to happen is that there's going to be either a floor or a ceiling. And one of those is going to move and it's going to move through that birefringence range. The birefringence being the distance between the ceiling and the floor. For uniaxial and biaxial, that is true. There's a ceiling and there's a floor. The difference with uniaxial is that one of them will stay where it is. So maybe the ceiling number will move or maybe the floor number will move. And this is what we're calling positive or negative optic sign. The question is which one is moving? So the thing that's a little bit tricky is that because of the way the lenses work in the refractometer, the lower number is actually on the upper end of the scale. The higher number going towards over the limit, higher refractive index, that's in the lower area. So that's the floor. Ceiling number is actually lower, floor number is higher. It's weird. But for optic sign, if we're talking about positive or negative, just remember that the numerical value, the bigger change, if it is the numerically smaller number, so that's going to be the ceiling, then that is negative. If it's the numerically higher number that's moving, the floor, that is positive. So with uniaxial positive, what we're going to see is that this upper number is going to stay where it is. And then as we rotate the stone and rotate the filter, 
it's going to blink in this lower area, the floor. So that's uniaxial positive. It's the higher numerical value. For biaxial stones like kunzite, and this is actually what sparked the thought for this video, as I was doing the kunzite video, I noticed that it was a more obvious fluctuation because kunzite is a biaxial stone. Now, whether it's biaxial positive or biaxial negative is slightly harder to distinguish than with uniaxial stones. Because biaxial, it still has a maximum and minimum refractive index, and therefore there's going to be a birefringence range. But the difference with biaxial stones is that both of those rays can move. The question is, for positive or negative, which one is moving farther? So for biaxial negative or positive, which one's which? If that lower number is moving more and the higher number is moving a little bit, they're going to meet somewhere in the middle. But that larger fluctuation on the lower side of the numerical range is going to make it biaxial negative. If the higher number is moving more and the lower number is moving a little bit or less, then that's going to be biaxial positive. So like I said, we're getting very into the weeds, and if you're asking why on earth would it be like this, then the simple answer is the crystal symmetry of each of these minerals is different. How many axes of symmetry does it have? Which direction are they growing at? This is the most fundamental building block of the crystal, and it just replicates itself as it grows. So how light travels through that crystal depends on the symmetry. Is one ray of light having to travel further? Is it bending further away? And with biaxial, keep in mind, that we've got two additional optic axes. So one thing that we need to talk about as to why this is applicable and why this is worth knowing is not just because it's you know interesting trivia and helpful for gem identification, because that's definitely part of it. Knowing whether or not it's positive or negative is connected to that mineral type. Now there are some minerals, typically biaxial ones, that can be positive and negative. But a majority of gemstones will typically be either positive only or negative only, typically. Do your research. And the reason that is valuable is as I am going through my gem identification, if I'm paying attention carefully, if I've got something like corundum, which I know is uniaxial negative, and then my refractive indexes, as I'm doing my tests with the refractometer, if I see that this is a positive mineral, I need to check again, because maybe I've stumbled across another rare mineral. Or it could be a completely new mineral. It's not like we've discovered everything on planet Earth. There are new minerals that are discovered. Hey, if I discover it, I can call it schmuckite. Oh, yes. Fantasies aside, discovering new minerals is part of it, but also when we think about how do we cut these stones, it's incredibly important to think about where are these axes. Having an awareness of where those optic axes are is important for gem cutters. So uniaxial, something like tourmaline or beryl, beryl being aquamarine, emerald, morganite, they tend to grow as tall pillars. So if it's growing in this direction, the c-axis is growing this direction as well, parallel to the direction of growth. And in some pieces of tourmaline, that c-axis is black or very deep brown. It's an off-color that's not as attractive as the other direction. If we look at the crystal from this direction, we might get an appealing blue or green or something else. So knowing what we know about optic axes, if we control the angles of that undesirable color, we can prevent how much of the light is going to mix in, and therefore the color. By keeping those angles steep, we can prevent that black or brown color from mixing in with the more desirable color, something vivacious. And that's really important to keep in mind with corundum as well. Ruby, that has more of a pink or more of an orange color, as opposed to a pure red, is substantially less expensive than a pure red. So how that crystal is oriented and what stone we can cut out of the crystal that's there needs to be taken into consideration. Are we just trying to preserve weight, use most of the crystal as possible, or are we trying to get the best color as possible? How that stone is oriented when it's cut relative to the crystal growth is very important for the mixing of those colors, and that's because of these optic axes. Stones like tanzanite or spodamine, these are biaxial stones, and because they have the c-axis as well as two additional optic axes, biaxial, we can actually have three colors. So as the stone is rotated 90 degrees, you can get it to change color, and that's all because of the crystal growth and these optic axes. So as a quick recap, we can find out the optic character using the polariscope, but it's not going to tell us this optic sign, whether or not it's positive or negative. Once I know it's uniaxial or I know it's biaxial, I can then go to the refractometer and find out, is it uniaxial positive? Positive, more movement down here in the higher numbers, or 
biaxial negative. Biaxial, again, both are going to move. So paying attention to that full range is important, and then paying attention to where the waves tend to move. Where is there more fluctuation? Very important, very difficult. But if you practice it, you can get good. And if you get good, you have more firm information, and your identification will be more reliable. So as always, head over to gemshepherd.com if you want to contact me directly or get on my mailing list and hear about the projects I'm working on in secret, semi-secret. The rest of you hit like, hit subscribe if you haven't already. Tell all of your friends about me. And until next time, bye-bye.